It is in the unknown though, that all possibility lies, all the growth and all our potential. If we already knew what we needed to be where we wanted to be, then we would be there already, wouldn't we? The difference between our world and our ideal world is an adaptation gap. It's the same difference between who we are and who we want to be. I had the opportunity to talk to the brilliant Dr. Mitu Steroni this week, and I got to cover loads of exciting new ground on the subject of potential. Her knowledge, her passion, her research was so powerful for me and helped me to obtain lots of interesting scientific takes for what I've been experiencing on a personal level, but also for the general concept of growth too. Dr. Mitu Steroni is a bit of a specialist when it comes to stress. Back when I was playing rugby, and I think it's still pretty prevalent in today's society, Stress seemed to be a a marker for your value or importance. It was often considered to be a direct representation of how much you cared or wanted something, like a sign of your dedication. The more stressed you were, then the more committed you must be. And in my case, definitely the more professional. It was such a dangerous interpretation, but boy did I make it and boy did I buy into it in a big way. In fact, I pretty much based my entire identity and self-worth on it. There is a key differential when it comes to stress that needs to be recognised, and it's between acute stress and chronic stress. Short-term bouts of acute stress have a phenomenally important role to play in cultivating growth, joy, health, performance, and actually in our general sense of aliveness, according to my guest. And then there's chronic stress. This is the more harmful one. This is the one that hangs about. It's difficult to escape from. It kind of drip feeds itself into our system. It's like a background noise we may not even be aware of. And it's the one behind the development of chronic inflammation and diseases and all kinds of limitations upon our experience too. Acute stress, as I understand it, is all about challenge, about purpose, passion, curiosity, wonder, excitement. It's the sort of thing that gives meaning to life. It's normally a kind of anticipation that opens the door into some kind of deeper engagement in life for us, into giving things a real go. And it's this absolute involvement in what we're doing that seems to come from the stress or as part of the stress that actually allows the stress to very quickly dissipate and the benefits to reveal themselves in its place. Sometimes it takes the form of just out and out physical survival. You know, the kind of fight or flight stuff you've seen on the TV when the gazelle is sprinting away from the lion, desperately doing whatever it can to get away. It escapes by the skin of its teeth and then after just a quick shake, a little check of its surroundings, it settles straight back down into focusing on its next bit of grass, eating away like nothing has happened. It seems so mad to even consider that type of behaviour. At the point where this happens, the brain actually, in a real world context, as I said, becomes very pliable. So it moves from going from a very rule-based routine system to one where it's suddenly open to learn. So it's prepared to let go of what it knows, to suddenly go into a new terrain and think, okay, hang on, the old rules don't work anymore. I'm supposed to have new rules. What are these new rules? I'm going to start with a blank slate. This state of the brain is what keeps the brain healthy and young and reduces the consequences of aging, because as it learns, it grows more connections. And we know now that plasticity in the brain, stimulation of the brain is what keeps it young. So when the mind is in a situation where you are in a state of high vigilance, but not quite stress, or even acute stress, but definitely not chronic stress. Your brain is in that extremely moldable form for it to pick up new information, new data, new rules, and for it to really thrive, but more importantly, for it to be able to adapt to change, which is the reason for our existence. Chronic stress is still all about survival too, but just without the letting go afterwards, and therefore the benefits. The challenge behind chronic stress seems to be more in the mind. We have way more luxury and definitely way less immediate physical survival concerns than we've ever had before. So it's become more about protecting our reputations, our possessions and our plans than it is about protecting our bodies anymore. No matter how much we try to control our way to safety though, the future just brings more uncontrollables. There may be no more lions stalking us from the bushes, 
but perhaps now we're starting to see all kinds of predators in our daily lives ready to take away bits of our image and our worth. We've also seen a movement into more cognitive roles and the constant intellectual demands that this brings has meant we're definitely living more through the mind, spending time in an imagined reality as opposed to directly connected to the reality of the present moment. For me, this kind of boils down to how we're constantly trying to work things out with our logic and deduce answers and solve challenges intellectually before we meet them. I guess with the sole purpose of avoiding ever having to meet them. We spend all our time scanning our environments. I say we and definitely including myself in this, analysing patterns, looking out for irregularities and anything we can classify as a threat to our status or our standing and to any of our comfort. We worry about what people think of us, how things might turn out, where it could all go wrong. I guess I could justify until the cows come home why I could carry on mentally exhausting myself like this. But what it really does is just takes away the permission I have to fully give myself to what I'm doing, even if it's the most simple endeavour. Something like this would release the stress, but now the stress just builds up and the momentum continues. More and more, work that used to be done by the hands is being done by the mind. So the cognitive load is, is becoming heavier and heavier and heavier. As soon as you start working under great cognitive load, your room for taking on additional pressure, additional stresses, becomes narrower. So we are engineering a world where we're leaving very little flexibility to deal with sudden amplifications of uncertainty and stress and so on. And perhaps even more importantly, as our world becomes more and more virtual, we are using the same part of the brain that you use in that changing room before you go onto the pitch. And we are using it Not because we are wondering what will happen next, not because we are trying to picture the future, but because almost every interaction right now is taking place in a virtual space, putting a great deal of load on our imagination. And if we exist within that realm, we are far more likely to imagine reality rather than experience it. And as I described before, as soon as you start living in an imaginary realm, Your imagination sets the boundary for what frightens you, for your fears, for your boundaries. It is in the unknown, though, that all possibility lies, all the growth and all our potential. If we already knew what we needed to be where we wanted to be, then we would be there already, wouldn't we? The difference between our world and our ideal world is an adaptation gap. It's the same difference between who we are and who we want to be. And this adaptation gap is something you'll hear Dr. Mitu talk about a lot during our discussion. It was a new one for me and a, one I'm really excited to explore. There is a human need to have a curiosity gap. There are lots of great psychologists who have written about how if we were to sit in a cave with absolutely no uncertainty around us, we would all go mad. So... We have evolved to need there to be some uncertainty around us, some element of surprise around us. A curiosity gap is what drives us to learn. And I'm going to bring in another uh, angle to this, which is I mentioned how when the brain starts feeling more and more uh, alert and vigilant and then more prepared for uncertainty, you have this burst of lots and lots of neurotransmitters going through it. And this takes the brain through a state where your performance is optimal and peak until you tip over. Now, just at that point before you tip over, there is ample evidence now to suggest that the brain actually physically becomes more pliable, which means that all the patterns all the learned information it has suddenly become easier to unlearn and let go. So it seems then that we really do need this unknown. We need to embrace this vulnerability to put ourselves out there in positions where we don't already have solutions or guarantees. And when we surrender to the higher intelligence that exists in this unknown, 
when we connect with it, we allow it to provide the bridge to the gap that we're faced with. This is growth. You don't get to know what your growth is going to be ahead of time, nor do you get to choose how you're going to adapt. I guess that would spoil all the fun anyway. It would remove the entire point of being alive. For me, when I've been in this state of total receptivity, it's like a stripped down sort of rawness, a bareness. It's in that state that intuition, impulse, insights and inspirations arise. It's a different dimension of living. It just doesn't compare to when you try to feel alive or you decide to feel inspired. It's just not the same. From where it all comes from, who knows? How it gets into our awareness, it's impossible to explain. In fact, it's pointless even trying to report on the experience because no words do it any kind of justice. Those words come out of the mind. We're back to the whole being in the zone thing again. I know I'm pretty much a broken record with this one. Well, the mental challenge that you talk about, when your mind is in this state where it has entered a state of anxiety, of hypervigilance, hyper-responsivity, there's this surge of noradrenaline going through your brain. You're under a state of high physiological arousal, cortical arousal. That point is the point where you essentially become human because you become an agent in a world you have to bring under your control. Before that, you are simply swimming with the known, even if it's a physical feat. But at that point, your brain is recalibrating itself. So there is data that you need to be in a state of high arousal for your brain to make this surge of connections. And we know that acute stress, it results in a surge of these neurotrophic molecules, these, these chemicals that increase new connections, that increase, in fact, even increase the growth of brain cells in, in animals. So that state of the brain where you mentally feel you are out of control and you need to make sense of everything is your brain trying to do just that. So one of the, I think one of the mistakes that we we make is we live in a way in you know especially in our western um, societies in our urbanized society so not in a really natural hunter gatherer in line with evolution society rather a sterile artificial environment we've created a situation where there is too much safety me too tells me about our unique individual levels of intolerance to uncertainty. These are actual measurable factors, she assures me. And they determine the way that we grow and how much we grow, I guess. So much of it comes down to our imagination. Apparently, the more unbound and free we are to roam creatively in the direction of wonder and curiosity, the more able we are to open up to that sweet spot for growth, that in an environment that leaves us alert and vigilant, but still so fascinated and in awe and reverent of life. So how do we lose this quality that seems so inherent and innate to us as children? Why does it disappear when we get older? Why do we seem far more inclined later on in our lives to tip over into that damaging space of hypervigilance, self-protection, fear and tension? You talk about imagination. Now, it is true that when you're a child, one thing I really like to use as an analogy is the older we grow, there is this trade-off between wonder and wisdom. When you're very young, the absence of wisdom is in a way the absence of knowing danger signals, of knowing what's the worst that can happen. When you're a six-year-old or a five-year-old kicking a ball, you don't really understand about contracts. You don't understand about reputation. You don't really care about the audience's expectation of you. For you, it's all wonder. It's not the wisdom of the negative result. You know, there's a great quote that 
being a great adult is actually learning how to be a child again. So that wisdom wonder trade-off is part of the reason why you become more attuned to a negative outcome as you grow older compared to when you're a child. I guess the way I see it is that we experience certain things in a certain way when we're younger, maybe difficult things, and the emotional reactions that these events trigger, they sort of install themselves as immediate understandings. And from those understandings, we do our best to create defense mechanisms that will prevent these things from happening again so we don't have to suffer them over and over. Yeah, we may try to create patterns of predicting, speculating and outthinking these kind of repetitions of trauma. But all we end up doing is living in that same kind of feeling and bringing it back up over and over again. We just reinforce all the connections and patterns between the body and the brain and they hardwire themselves in as black and white truths about how life is and who I must be. And these self-imposed limits, they form the basic of our logic and our intellect, our way of seeing things. And naturally they start thinking for us and then dreaming for us, if you can call worst case scenarios dreaming. The result is that we begin or certainly I have begun, suffering my imagination. Rather than getting to explore and enjoy the creative capacity I have as a living being to influence and, and manifest my world, I'm now suffering my imagination and holding myself back from what I'm truly capable of. This reminds me of a quote I heard our previous guest, Sadhguru, say once, every conclusion we make about life removes a little bit more of life from it. It feels like it fits just about here. I don't see solidified ideas as wisdom. They're definitely not universal truths. They're just more like dead ends. For me, wisdom is something that opens up space. It's something that helps us or helps me to dissolve or transcend boundaries, to grow and expand effortlessly, not to contract and lock ourselves away and lock myself away. So what is wisdom for me? From this chat with Mitu Steroni, it brings to mind the idea of Dreaming big, as big as possible of the life that we wish to live, then facing with courage the challenges that arise from it, welcoming the old and familiar feelings, perhaps guilt, shame, fear, anger, bitterness, frustration, unworthiness, and then just sitting with them, accepting these feelings and allowing them rather than trying to rid ourselves of them, solve them or work them out. And if all the while we can be saying yes to what life presents us with, seeing it as part of the path, not as a wrong turn, and engaging fully in it through our highest possible excitement in that moment, then we can have the trust and the knowing that we are right where we're supposed to be, that what we need is right here with us too. We can then become receptive to it. Dr. Mitu gives her take on this beautifully. How do you live in the moment? I think you cannot predict the moment on a moment-to-moment -moment basis because life means you are going to be encountering novelty consistently. If that were not the case, we might as well all be dead, quite literally. Now, what that moment presents at any particular time is finite from the outside, but it's infinite from your point of view. So you could be a train cleaner, but you could spend as much time and give as much thought and as much energy to making your part of that job the most extraordinary you can ever imagine. And I think for me, the philosophy of, of living in the moment, which, which can sometimes sound like a little bit of a cliche, is really that. It is really optimizing your current situation to use as many of your resources and your skill and your talent to make the simplest things extraordinary so that every moment in your day, you cannot just pass off. You can fill with an extraordinary experience of feeling alive. When we update ourselves constantly in every moment like this, it actually translates to feeling brand new and young. I like to think of of it is just coming back to being the now me. 
My experience has told me time and time again that I am actually fully equipped to handle and thrive in my now, in this unknown. But I'm not at all equipped to thrive in the future. That beautiful privilege belongs to the future adapted me, not me now. The best thing I can do for that future me is liberate myself from my past me and all his conclusions and assumptions. There is definitely a world of difference between allowing myself to become all I can be and trying to become what I think I should be. You could call this one of the most important adaptation gaps there is, I think, and what I'm really trying to explore with this podcast. What an amazing guest Mitu Steroni was. I'm simply loving meeting these people and allowing them to take us on a journey into the unknown, into possibilities, and joining forces with you on this journey, being able to share and exchange, hearing your contribution, hearing your feedback, getting your guidance and your support too, just makes it incredibly worthwhile. Please do keep everything coming in. If there's anything that comes to mind, anything that springs up, any inspirations, any intuition that you're experiencing, just send it on through. And we can keep this uh, momentum going. Thank you so much for listening to today's Tuesday episode of I Am. The Tuesday drops are definitely a space for me to reflect on the interviews to come and set the scene a little. And hopefully I've done this for you and you're now very excited to listen. The full episode will follow in a couple of days, so keep your ear out for it. As always, I really want this to be a two-way conversation. So if you've got any questions, just pop a review in the review section on Apple Podcasts or contact me through my social channels. I would love to hear from you. Until then, I'm Johnny Wilkinson, and this is I Am. I am.